captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, where he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, even Jesus the Christ. Please be seated. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the word nepotism is defined as a noun, favoritism, as in appointment to a job based on kinship. Nepotism, to put it simply, means someone gets something for being a part of the family. Nepotism in our age is most prominent in the area of politics. Some of you may be old enough to remember the controversy that surrounded President John F. Kennedy's nomination of his obviously underqualified younger brother Bobby to be the Attorney General of the United States. At only 35 years old, with no courtroom experience, Bobby Kennedy's appointment to that high post would require intervention from no less than the patriarch of the Kennedy clan, Joseph B. Kennedy, Sr. More recently, former President Donald Trump appointed his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, to be his senior White House advisor and point man for Middle Eastern affairs, a role for which Mr. Kushner would appear to be lacking in notable experience. Well-informed folks, like members of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Hecla, South Dakota, will also be aware of the appointment of Mr. Hunter Biden to the board of directors of Burisma Group, one of the largest natural gas firms in the Ukraine. Now, of course, the Burisma Group is not a part of the executive branch of the United States government, but I'm guessing there may have been just a little bit of nepotism involved. For you see, Hunter Biden's father just happened to be the vice president of the United States, the current president of the United States, oh. Joseph Robinette Biden, Jr., a part of the family. In the case of Attorney General Robert Kennedy, one can make the case that his appointment via nepotism worked out pretty well, especially his efforts to combat the plague of organized crime in the 1960s. Unfortunately, because of overt censorship of all things Trump administration, you may not be aware that son-in-law Jared Kushner was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to negotiate peace treaties between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan. Because of overt censorship, you may also not have heard that Mr. Hunter Biden was paid $50,000 a month for his important position with a huge natural gas firm, even though he previously had no experience whatsoever in the production of natural gas. Ah, nepotism. Success for being a part of the family. Oddly enough, the word nepotism has religious, not political, roots. It comes from the Italian word nepotismo, which is based on the Latin root nepos, meaning nephew. It seems it was so common in ancient times for church leaders to give their nephews important jobs that a new word was coined, nepotism, a part of the family. And that, my friends, brings us to our topic of meditation this evening. Here again. Then the band 
And the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Nepotism comes into play immediately after the Lord was kidnapped in the Garden of Gethsemane by no less than 600 Roman legionnaires, not to mention several lackeys of the Jewish leadership. Now you'd think that Mary Band would take Jesus to the man in charge, and guess what? They did. Sure, Caiaphas held the title of high priest, but it doesn't take much to figure out who was really in charge. After Annas held the office of high priest for nine years himself, no less than five of his sons would also hold that office. And yes, Caiaphas, the current office holder, had married into the family. Nepotism. Such a dynasty had never happened before nor would it ever happen again. Now, of course, Jesus would never be a part of Anna's family, but even the Lord acknowledges who's really running the show by answering him, although not in the way Anna's hopes. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world, I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Just like so many church leaders today, Annas couldn't have cared less about Jesus' doctrine. You see, Annas was hoping the Lord would say something that could be used against him, something that could be passed on to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, and the rest of the Sanhedrin to help seal Jesus' fate. Jesus knows exactly what Annas is up to, but oddly enough, instead of objecting to the farce, Jesus gently reminds his judge how he's supposed to do a judge's job. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. You're putting me on trial for what I teach? I've hidden nothing? i preached it to the whole world. Call witnesses. Ask the whole world what I've taught. Remember, two or three witnesses. Do your job, high priest. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? No way was this guy ever going to be a part of Anna's family, but that doesn't stop him from trying to curry some favor from the old man. Were this a legitimate legal proceeding, his striking of a prisoner in front of a judge would have been an outrage. Instead, he knows that hitting Jesus hard enough to draw blood would bring a smile to Anna's face. The whole thing is a travesty of justice. Beating a prisoner in front of a judge who isn't the official judge of an illegal interrogation in the middle of the night? It's all a farce. Why doesn't someone speak up? Where is the whole world Jesus has been preaching to? Where are his disciples? Where is Peter? Oh, yeah. He's hiding out in the courtyard, warming himself by the fire. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. Good thing you're not like that, eh? You always treat Jesus like he's one of the family. You would never deny being a follower of Jesus Christ by watching the latest Hollywood blasphemy on Netflix or Prime. You would never deny being a follower of Jesus Christ by looking the other way when a 
schoolmate or a teacher or co-worker takes the Lord's holy name in vain. Unlike cowardly Peter, you would have been first in line to let Annas and Caiaphas and all those people standing around in the courtyard that night know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are a part of Jesus' family, no matter what it costs. Why, I bet you'd have given that old guard a whack of your own. And maybe you will even told old Annas a thing or two before all was said and done. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Ah, uh, whom are we kidding? It doesn't work that way at all, does it? How often does the opportunity arise to let the world know that Jesus is a part of the family? But you would deny it 70 times 7 before the rooster crowed, at work, at school, with friends, even in front of other Christians whose church has some strange ideas about Jesus' doctrine. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You may have spent more than a fair amount of time denying that you're a part of Jesus' family, but thank God Almighty that until the end of time, Jesus will always use a little nepotism of his own to make sure that you are a part of the family. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son than an heir of God through Christ. And that, dearly beloved, is what Jesus' doctrine, Christianity, is all about. You were an enemy of God, a part of the devil's family. But God wasn't having any part of it. He loves you so very much that he used divine nepotism, sending his own son in the flesh to steal you away from the devil and an eternity burning in hellfire. Oh, it wasn't easy. It meant coming down off the throne of the king of kings and getting down in the dirt with the rest of us, born of a woman, suffering poverty and hunger, and pain, and all the very same temptations the devil throws your way each and every day. There is one difference, of course. Jesus suffered everything you have ever suffered. Only he did it without a single sinful thought, word, or deed. He had to, for your sake. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The sham interrogation by Annas, the beating from the guards, the kangaroo court with Caiaphas and the rest of the Sanhedrin. Ultimately, 
Jesus allowed himself to be riveted to a cross and die to make sure that you are a part of the family. It's just like the Holy Ghost led son-in-law Caiaphas to say, in spite of himself, consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It was and is expedient that the one God-man, Jesus Christ, died for all the people, including and especially you, so that nobody need perish in hell, but winds up instead being a part of God's family. Now, as Lutheran Christians, we are especially blessed to know just how the good Lord delivers this incredible blessing of nepotism from 2,000 years ago to the members of his family here today. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. No decision you make but the decision God Almighty made to make you a part of the family when you were sealed into his family through his word and the water of holy baptism. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. No decision you make but the decision God Almighty made to make you a part of the family through the proclamation of his word from the pulpit and read from the pages of Holy Scripture. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my, my, testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. No decision you make, but the decision God Almighty made to make you and keep you a part of the family by giving and preserving saving faith unto life everlasting through the gift of his holy body and precious blood in the Lord's Supper. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God even to them that believe on his name. My fellow sinners and fellow redeemed, throughout this Lenten season and forever, rejoice that you have been declared worthy by God's nepotism that makes you a part of the family, part of God's family through the death and glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall guard and keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.